Welcome to Talent Unfiltered. Located at the intersection of innovation and all things talent. Talent Unfiltered is presented by HireWorks. HireWorks, talent forward. Now, here is your host, Ron Godier. It is Monday, March 30th, 2020, and welcome to Talent Unfiltered, presented by HireWorks. I am your host, Ron Godier, and you are looking at the Wrigley Field neighborhood here in Chicago, side by side with the world famous Abbey Road Crossing, immortalized by the Beatles. And that is up in honor of our guest today, Hung Lee, who is the founder at Workspace IO, who will join us live from London. And more on that in just a little while. Uh, before we get started for the day, I, I want to take a minute and just sincerely wish you all the very best. Um, I think this is one of those times where it's very easy to become disconnected, where it's very easy to feel like we are separated. The government has a, uh, a, a kind of a hashtag campaign out there called uh, Alone Together. And I, and I think that that's, in, in some ways, it's a great sentiment. I think as human beings, it's very easy to pull back and to begin to feel isolated, to begin to find, uh, or to begin to feel like you're not connected to the world that you knew anymore. And in many ways, we aren't. But I would encourage you to find ways to reconnect with family, to reconnect with friends, uh, one of the things that I've been doing recently is when I talk to clients, I am literally setting up virtual coffees, virtual coffee. I have a cup of coffee, they have a cup of coffee. We sit down and we talk. And in most cases, it's not about business. It's not about how to further the relationship or to grow uh, revenue. It's about what can I do to help you as a human being. And I think in this time, that is something that we could all use a lot of. We seem to be getting some conflicting messages from leadership. Uh, on one hand, you have the federal government uh, sending one message, and I think even the message inside the federal government is conflicted. It's, it's contradictory. And on the other side, you have people like Governor Cuomo uh, in New York, uh, who is giving us very straight, very real facts uh, from what's happening in his state. Uh, so I think it's hard to discern. I hope that over the course of this podcast continuing to go, uh, uh, and do this each and every week that we bring you some things to think about, that we give you a connection to people who are in very similar situations to you and that we find ways to, uh, connect, uh, more closely, not only you and I as viewer and, and, and I guess host or whatever, um, but as human beings, I think that that's, that's very, very important. Um, okay, so before we get started, I want to go and uh, I want to go through this and just let you know that you can connect with the show on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, and on Snapchat. The show is available on Spotify, iTunes, Buzzsprout, and SoundCloud. And there's also a video version of the show uh, on YouTube. All you need to do is just search Talent Unfiltered on any of those platforms and you'll be able to find it. You can also email us at talent, I'm sorry, at show info at talent unfiltered. Uh, dot com. Over the course of the next week, uh, I'm going to be rolling out some things from my company uh, and personally about ways that we can try to uh, connect a little bit differently. One of those things is a hashtag, and I'd like you all to begin to use this if you can. Uh, and you'll see it at the bottom of your screen there, uh, United We Win. Uh, I believe that if we stick together through this, we have an opportunity to see our way to the other side. Whatever that other side is, we can face that together, and I hope that you will uh, will join me uh, in that. As I said, uh, you can connect with us on any of the platforms. Uh, our platform information is in the comment section below. We hope that you will reach out to us soon. If you dig what we do, then like, share, and subscribe on whatever platform you are catching us on. As I said, our guest today is Hung Lee. He is the founder of Workspace IO, and Workspace IO is a forward-thinking company built on the idea of making technical hiring more effective for candidates and companies. He's also the curator of a great newsletter and podcast called Recruiting Brain Food, and it's an excellent and amazing resource for anybody who is in the talent and recruiting space. Hung, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Ron. I'm, I'm uh, safe and okay, so pleased to have a chat with, uh, with you over, over the, the internet. 
Yeah, no, it's uh, it's an interesting time. You know, I was thinking uh, prior to this when we were doing our prep work um, about how different and how similar the response to the COVID nine out uh, COVID nineteen outbreak is in all across the world. It seems like people are always running to catch up uh, because they make this assumption that it's as as we did here, our leadership did here, that it's very similar to the flu. And in most cases, I think it is. But but the I'd be interested to hear what what your thoughts around the response in the UK have been. What has that been like? Because we see Boris Johnson on the television talking about lockdowns. And, and like here in America, we see people who aren't necessarily abiding by that, right? And, uh, and I'd love to get your take on, uh, on what we should know as people here in the States about what's going on in, uh, you know, in your home country. Yeah, I mean, firstly, a de declaration of, of positioning. I'm, I'm, I'm an opponent of Boris Johnson. I think he's absolutely the wrong person to be the prime minister of any country. Uh, unsuitable. Uh, Thank you. Uh, that was yeah, awesome. <laughs> I need to say that because uh, it's, it's very clear. I think that's actually not an uncommon opinion. Um, that said, uh, he's been given a, a very difficult task. I would say, arguably, an impossible one to, to do well. This is this is. You know, I, I, I don't see any government uh, having a good COVID. You know, uh, this is this is a terrible scenario. It seems that no government is really well prepared to deal with it. Um, what I find from the the UK government's position, though, I think it's disingenuous. Um, uh, they are awesome. saying one thing. Because it's not a lockdown, man. Um, they, they say it's a lockdown uh, apart from if you need to go to work. Um, and they say that you should stay in the home unless you fancy a walk in the park. Um, so, so the messaging is, is clearly incoherent. Um, it doesn't comport with what the demand is. So I'm thinking that, and this is why you do see people walking around and, and doing whatever, uh, even though traffic has definitely slowed down, there has been sort of a lot more people being vigilant, but it's guidance. It's not a mandate, right? It's like, hey, we reckon you should do this, but hey, if you fancy some exercise, go take a walk. Um, and those things are incompatible. Um, uh, you know, the idea of a lockdown is that you actually stay in um, as much as you can. Um, the only reason why you go out should be to go and get food. And even then you should limit your trips to the market. Uh, to once a week, once two weeks, uh, just to reduce your exposure. So that's the theory behind lockdown. Um, but I don't think we're doing lockdown very well. It's a porous lockdown. Um, and uh, uh, it will have some effect, but probably not uh, uh, not the optimal effect, let's say. Um, but yeah. then there's... Go on. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, the final point on that is what is the optimal effect? Because famously, the UK charted kind of a contrarian course on this. Um, to say that, oh, actually, we should uh, try and infect a certain percentage of people. Um, uh, with the, the key aim is to manage the uh, the caseload numbers, um, but not to try and completely suppress it. Like, uh, you know, the, the strategy has been in, let's say, the East Asian countries have been trying South to Korea. absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah, absolutely, they're trying to to, to suppress it um, and 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 stamp it out. So I think the uh, the UK may have either thought that was a bad idea or they may have thought that it's not doable with the systems we have, or the political systems and the tools that we have here uh, and the, the, the behavior and the culture that we have in the UK may not be compatible with uh, a very stringent quarantine uh, that might be a more doable in different uh, parts of the world. So, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to be overly critical one way, but I, I do think that the messaging is really weird um, and there's ambiguity. People still aren't sure what is allowed or not. Like technically I'm allowed to shop. So theoretically I just need to pick up like a shopping bag and walk out in the street and you know, I should be good to go. But then you see on the other side, police are arresting people and, uh, and they're saying, you know, you need to, you need to go home. So, um, the, the, it's confused. And I think that confusion probably is not a, a plan. It's just bad execution. Um, Johnson is not a, not a guy good on details. Um, and I think right now we need leading. We, we have the exact same problem here in the States, right? We have a guy that's not a details guy. Um, and right. I, don't, I don't care what your political leanings are. If you can honestly look at somebody and say, this has been handled well, you're disingenuous at best uh, and careless uh, at, uh, at worst. You're not thinking through what the problem you know, really is. Um, 
you know, we have situations here in the States on where um, we have a, just the other day, President Trump uh, had a press conference where he talked about, you know, hot spots versus areas that weren't affected as much. And it seems to me that somewhere in the middle of this, the, the drive to get the economy going, which I totally understand. I totally get that. And I know he's been, I, I didn't vote for the man, but I can tell you that I know he's been dealt uh, a really crappy hand, right? I mean, I get that. This is not one of those things that any president wants to deal with. But George Bush dealt with it during 9-11 and other people have dealt with uh, things like the Great Depression and, and things like the tragedies and crisis uh, in our country. To be so focused on the economy without listening to the people who actually know what they're talking about when it comes to pandemics and infectious disease seems to me to be uh, a careless, um, callous, uh, and really doesn't tell me that you care about what happens to me as a human being. And that leads me to my next question. It's really a two part um, before we kind of get on to some of the other stuff here. But it, do you feel that that is similar in terms of what Boris Johnson and the people inside the UK and maybe Europe as, as a larger percentage are, are doing? And, and what is the perception of the United States response as quote unquote, the leader of the free world? What's, what's the perception in other parts of the world, like in London, of our response to that and how, how we're managing it and how we're dealing with it? Um, well, I think, I think basically a lot of us have friends in the US. Um, you know, we've got lots of connections. This is true in Europe, but I think particularly so in the UK. Uh, and we're, we're very fearful for you guys, you know, um, uh, because there's amazing things happening, but it seems to be happening at, at the levels below the, the, the White House. Uh, you know, you see some very visible leadership uh, at the state level, let's say, at the city level, um, and, and even below, you know, from community-led type initiatives and sure. uh, even entrepreneurs and stuff like that stepping up to do stuff. Um, but there seems to be a lack of centralized response that's adequate for the, for the, for the, for the situation at hand. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that it may be a, a fundamental characteristic of how the United States is, you know, uh, I think a lot of people outside of the U S don't quite understand that it is a collection of States, um, under a federal government and not the a unitary state, if you like, like a lot of, uh, European countries are, um, and, and so it, it can be puzzling to see why is, 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 let's say New York, for instance, seems to be left to, to very much fend for themselves when mm. really the action should be to try and surge support there. Um, because if Trump is correct, and I think he is in this case, that there are certain places in, in the country that uh, do not currently have um, a significant outbreak of COVID-19 yet, um, uh, they have excess capacity of materials and uh, protective equipment and stuff like that, that they could potentially move um, to uh, the place that really need it. Um, but I'm seeing online that, you know, the, the, I forget the guy's name, who the, um, the leader in, in, in the, the uh, New York area is. No, he's like uh, making, Andrew, Cuomo. Andrew Cuomo, yeah. Right, that guy. He's like making uh, public appeals on Twitter for like ventilators and stuff. And I'm thinking, wow, that, he should not need to, need to do that. You know, there, there, sh there should be a mechanism where the, uh, the, the, <laughs> the material resources of the yeah. United States, the number one country in terms of its ability, its resources, its... Uh, prowess, uh, all that type of stuff that should be there. You, you know, you shouldn't up to a guy having to make an appeal on Twitter. Um, and that's, that's, that's desperate stuff, you know? You know, it's interesting because, um, we find that like there was a, a I guess, a, a, a note going around on social media. There was a, a post going around on social media asking if Andrew Cuomo was now the president of the United States because he was saying things in real terms to people that felt real and felt transparent rather than, pardon my French, the BS that we get from our leadership at the federal level. It, it feels like, uh, it, it feels like, um, it feels like there's an extreme disconnect between the reality on the ground and the very top echelon of our, of our government. And, well, and, I, and I don't get that. Well, Ron, it's, it's quite simple. I mean, uh, Mr. Trump has, has always lived in that way. Um, uh, you know, his, his entire thing is, a his entire world is a rhetorical world. Um, uh, you know, he's always been disconnected. And the same with Boris Johnson, actually. They're both basically 
um, uh, rhetoricians. You know, they basically say one thing. It's, it doesn't need to be connected with reality, um, but they've got this un uncanny and, uh, and, and uh, unfortunate ability uh, for, for those words to have impact um, and, and have effect. Um, and so Trump can say things that are blatantly untrue uh, and demonstrably so. Even, oftentimes you can simply quote Trump back to himself um, to disprove <laughs> yeah. his point. He, he does that regularly. Um, but that doesn't seem to humble him in any way um, or cause him to, cause him to pause uh, the next time he would, he would say things. And again, Johnson's the same. I think they're both people that are very much in the moment. Um, the priority when they're in that moment is to try and secure some sort of popularity or to, you know, uh, say a few zingers, uh, if you like, and then do, and then that it seems that the policy can sometimes be led by the rhetoric. So they, they might speak out of out off script, and suddenly mm -hmm. that becomes the policy. It's like crazy. What are you um, doing? Uh, yeah. And I, I think that actually happened in, um, in, in the UK specifically with this event because Boris Johnson went on a TV show. Um, and he was interviewed on a TV show on the sofa and he was literally discussing what, how to deal with this COVID outbreak. And he mentioned something about herd immunity and he mentioned something about, oh, uh, there's a theory that this might happen. And then suddenly everyone realized, oh, is this what he actually plans? And it was up in arms. So I think both of these are undisciplined um, verbiose types. They're just going to come in and talk, um, often disconnected to their brain. Um, and in a, in a position of authority, that's a huge problem. Right. Um, I mean, one of the things that is definitely true as well, like you do see the quality of the American people. Um, you mentioned people like Cuomo. Uh, you see other leaders that are emerging from the medical field, from the entrepreneurial field, from all kinds of places. So many great leaders in the country. But there's a problem when, you know, those people don't seem to be able to make it to the, the most important role. Um, and the yeah. most important role is occupied by someone who isn't a, good, a great any of those things. Um, and I think that's a problem with our system of politics. Uh, the same in the UK, same in a lot of European countries, actually. Mm -hmm. We've basically succumbed to electing demagogues and, uh, into, into political office. And these are not the type of people you want in a crisis. Yeah, it's, it's weird. I, I also, you know, you brought up a great point there, and I, I'm going to move on to some of the other things we wanted to talk about here in a second, because left to my own devices, I will sit here and talk about politics all day long, and I'm not sure that that's the most valuable thing that we can be talking about at this moment. But having said that, um, I think that y you talked about being uh, uh, verbose uh, people, verbose leaders. It is interesting to me that it seems that both of them abhor anyone else getting the credit for saving the situation other than themselves. And I, yeah, I know I'm going to get slammed about that. I know people are going to come back to me and they're going to say, why are you saying that? But it feels very, very true to me that uh, they are spending their time trying to figure out how they look like they're the ones that actually saved us. And I'm not sure that that is the best use of anyone's time at any rate. Kind of want to move on to your area of expertise because I think that, you know, we can look at what's going on in unemployment on Thursday uh, of last week. There was uh, an announcement here in the United States that 3.3 million uh, people have filed for unemployment last week's job claims. Uh, we're only going to see that uh, move forward going into this week. And I, I think that that has an impact on not only how the economy operates, and I'm sure it's very similar in the UK, but, but also on the perception of how people think about hiring and what will be the influencing parts of this. Now, I'd like to get your take on what you think the trends in, are going to be over the course of the next 90, 180 years, three years, stuff like that, but also the capabilities that people need to have in order to assess hire and find talent and also to be a successful job seeker because I think what people are going to look for is going to change pretty dramatically and and given your background I'd love to I'd love to hear what you think about that yeah I mean uh, I, I hear the figures um, and, and they, they, they resonate with reality you know I mean same thing happening everywhere mass redundancies uh, hiring freezes um, uh, a lot of redeployment going on um, a lot of people out of work you know when you where there's I think something like two billion people 
um, uh, a lockdown right now on the planet. That's that's amazing. Um, uh, maybe no other event other than a pandemic could ever do that. Almost 25% of the entire population. Of the planet, right? Incredible. And that basically means a lot of businesses are going to the wall. Um, now, I think you make a very good point that post-COVID world is going to look very differently. Um, I think job seeking is going to look differently and the skills that are in demand are going to be differently. Example, everyone shifted suddenly to remote work. Um, remote work is not a virtualization of in-person. It's actually a very different mode of working, different types of communication required, different types of skills required. Um, and I think we're going to find out very quickly who's going to be good at this and who isn't. Um, so one of the things I think if you're on the market, in fact, if you're any kind of employee is that you've got to get good at being a distributed and remote worker, um, because that's how you're going to be interviewed. That's how you're going to be assessed. Uh, that is probably how you might even start work right now. So I know, you know, if you're in a process or you're going to find work right now, you're not going to be marching into an office and shaking people's hands. You're going to be conducting an interview like this over the video. Um, and, and again, the skills involved in that, um, uh, you know, it's, it's a slightly different way of uh, communicating um, uh, in video. Um, when you're distributed working, suddenly written communication becomes much more important than, than spoken. Uh, asynchronous communication becomes much more important than synchronous. Um, and you've got to get good at those things um, because if you can't, um, you're going to be a weaker employee than someone who, who can. Um, so yeah, I think the, the workforce will change. The mode of working is changing uh, and therefore the skills we need are going to change. Uh, the premium skills are going to change. When you think about companies, um, you know, to me, that's there, there's two sets of upheaval in this, right? There's, workers and then there's companies and there's a very human aspect to this. Last week uh, I had on a gentleman by the name of Marina Sandriel from Aon and we talked about kind of the components of what goes into an environment like this. There's a human component, there's a worker component, and there's a company component based on how they're going to think about things. I'd like to get some, some sense of what you're hearing from your clients because I'm hearing certain things from the clients that we serve in my company. Um, about this move to a really remote, truly remote workforce. Um, I personally think that the companies that can't embrace it, that can't figure out how to do this, are doomed. I think that they are, they have some very significant, very rough roads ahead of them. And I think in places like the restaurant industry specifically, you're going to see changes in terms of how those people do business from it's going to be hard to it's going to be hard for them to catch up to Grubhub, DoorDash, any of the delivery uh, 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 pieces out there. But you may see them move to a model strictly like that, where there is no personal uh, touch. And 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 are we ready, Hung, as a society, to be that disconnected from physical uh, connection, physical uh, contact, even if it's only for three or four months? Are we really ready psychologically to handle? Uh, we're not ready, but we're going to we're going to get re ready through the experience. Um, uh, because one one thing that is true when you have this type of phase shift is that the things that you end up practicing now you end up retaining, um, even if it does go quote unquote back to normal. Um, now, one thing that is interesting about COVID nineteen is that it's an accelerant of underlying trends that were already happening. Um, mm -hmm. The likes of Grubhub and DoorDash were already eating into the restaurant margins. Um, because, hey, you could get restaurant quality food without having to go. Um, and the convenience of that was already being recognized by the consumer. So the restaurant trade is already under pressure. Um, this is going to really pressure the restaurant trade. Um, people are going to be much more conscious of hygiene, much more conscious of food hygiene. Um, uh, they're going to get used to ideas of, uh, of, of communicating and, and connecting without being in person. There's a lot of training right now going on. Um, we're, we're getting trained on how to be social digitally, right? I mean, I tried to call a friend of mine yesterday. He said, Hong, sorry, man, I'm in a virtual birthday party. Um, yeah, exactly. exactly. So he's getting into that. And I'm thinking, right, what that is, is a training for, for this type of future. Now, I'm not saying that the restaurant trade is finished, but it will accelerate an underlying trend that was already happening. Um, so I think uh, food, retail, hospitality, those types of things, um, are going to be, uh, are going to be, uh, uh, I wouldn't say end, but it will be low growth. Um, and you'll see the things that replace those 
a high growth? Like how do we do entertainment uh, uh, without uh, without the in-person? So the digital meetups, the esports, uh, the video gaming, um, all those underlying trends that was, was trending anyway, have just got a you know big boost because um, a lot of us are, are going to get into that stuff. Sure, we you know it's interesting because um, normally when I'm working on business development for uh, for the company. Uh, I have a lot of coffee meetings, a lot of quick, hey, let's get together for 15, 20 minutes to have a conversation. Even if it doesn't go anywhere, let's do that. And all of my meetings now, uh, I'm putting them out as virtual coffees. I grab a coffee, they grab a coffee, and we talk just like this. Uh, and, and I think that that's part of the new paradigm. And I know this is off topic, but let me ask you this. It, it's not off topic, but it's, it's um, not continuing on the talent thing. This is more of a, a perception um, uh, situation. I kind of believe this, and I want to see what you think. I think that after this is over, there is going to be a rush to be outside, that people are going to do less ordering and less isolating once we get the all clear, hey, everybody has enough antibodies now, or whatever the case may be. We think we're in a place where we can do this. I think there's going to be a rush, and I think that could be one of the things that helps spur a little bit of the economy. But I do believe that, that by that time, companies like Grubhub, DoorDash, and things like that will have really captured a huge percentage uh, of the market and it may be tough for them to recover. Do you, you share that sentiment or is that, am I off there? No, I think that's, a, I would agree 100% with what you just said. I think there will be a massive surge of people wanting to do the stuff that they've missed. Um, there'll also be a little bit more fatalism about it because, hey, we survived it and then they're going to start spending. So less future planning, there'll be lots of consumption and all that type of stuff. Uh, but you're right. I mean, the, the, a lot of the services that, that you would normally go to will not survive this period, um, especially if you're looking at restaurant trade, pubs, bars, those types of things. Um, uh, those are uh, organizations that really do depend on cash flow. Um, and, and uh, con consistent consumer behavior, let's say, um, they can't handle three months uh, lockdown. Uh, they can't handle two, two, two months uh, two, or two weeks lockdown. You know, this is catastrophic. Um, so um, I hope that this is where the government needs to step in. Um, uh, they need to step in and guarantee that those institutions and those businesses survive. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll see whether, whether, whether the, 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 gov the governments respectively can respond to that. Um, sure. Okay, so uh, I've talked about a lot of different things. I want to kind of get into the meat. Uh, focused uh, the businesses that are focused on talent. Uh, mm -hmm. We are trying to uh, build um, uh, services that are a response to what's going on right now. And we've develop programs that are specific to this that have, you know, no contracts and easily and rapidly deployed for those people who are still trying to hire. And we've transitioned into transportation, uh, which we have some experience in and healthcare, which we have some experience in, but we're placing more focus on being able to deliver that. The question I have for you is, I think that this forced remote work is going to have a pretty significant impact on candidate preferences on the way people want to work. Because I think as people, there are some people out there who are like, I gotta be in an office, I gotta do what I gotta do. But as they begin to gravitate to this and understand that it's not scary, um, I think that you're gonna see a bigger push in that in Canada preferences and companies are gonna have to adjust. So that said, talk about that a little bit. And then also, how is your company, WorkShape, uh, going to adjust to account for those preferences as you're beginning to assess jobs and beginning to assess talent? Well, I mean, let's deal with the latter one first. Basically, because WorkShape's always been dealing with, um, uh, if you like, remote uh, friendly or remote uh, literate uh, population, these are software engineers. Um, so they have always been ahead of the game in terms of ahead of the trend that the, the wider market will be in. Definitely, we've seen that organizations that have had success are the ones that are able to offer remote working um, uh, way and above any, you know, a collocation. Uh, so I think that will replicate across um, to um, different functions in different fields where, where people can work remotely. Um, you know, the job can be, uh, the, it can be delivered from anywhere. Uh, companies that are able to offer that as a default will, will, will definitely outcompete those that can't. 
And in fact, I would say that very companies are going to learn to do that. Uh, you know, I don't see any recalcitrant businesses that uh, that are sticking out and saying, "Sure, we're definitely going to get all these office workers back in." They're going to recognize that actually, um, I'm spending. Uh, all of this uh, business rent on an office that's empty right now. That's what their companies are getting right now. Right. Yeah. Um, and they're going to think that was dumb to ever commit to that. Um, why don't I just get rid of the office and, fit and find people that can work remotely? Um, and that's what's going to happen. So I think this is a huge shift. Um, it's positive in many respects because it means that we can get rid of things that no one enjoys. No one enjoys the commute. Uh, no one enjoys massively high price uh, sort of uh, rental costs and, and, and office space costs and stuff like that. Um, all that's because we were obsessed with getting people in the building. Um, uh, but a lot of work does not require that. Um, and if people can uh, work from where, wherever they want, so it doesn't have to be from home, but from whatever location they happen to be in, um, that should mean that local economies will benefit um, because that's a consumer spending time in a certain place is going to go out and spend stuff in that place. Um, and, and you're not going to get a situation where all of the wealth, all the labor, all of the economic power flows to a city center that we've seen. So um, uh, the economic term is agglomeration effect, right? Urban agglomeration, where essentially um, basically uh, 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 metropolitan hubs have a gravitational power. The bigger they get, the bigger they get, because sure. um, you know it means that more opportunity more uh, competitors are there, more sort of, uh, sort of customers are there, should I say, more ability to recruit talent, et cetera. Um, of the, of the, the new tech jobs that have been created, I think over the last 10 years in the US, 80% um, of them have been created in five different metropolitan hubs. And you know which ones they are. Uh, sure. Without even thinking about it, you know uh, where these jobs are. Now that is because we were obsessed with bringing technical workers into an office building. We're learning, actually, we don't need to do that. Those people will now stay where they are. Um, a, a lot of them would um, stay where they are. Um, and that's good for those places that are so-called economically left behind. So I think there is, um, you know, if you, you kind of step back and zoom out from obviously the, the crisis that we have now and, and the, the very real individual uh, tragedies that we're seeing, we zoom out at a, at a very high level. You can see, you know what? Um, there, w there was a, a trend that we, we wanted to reverse, which is this agglomeration effect. Maybe COVID-19 gives us the opportunity to do that. Yeah, it's, you know, it, it, to me, this is one of those things that is going to force us to evolve. Uh, and I think, I think there's some real positives out of this. I know it's hard to see that right now, but I think that there are real positives because I think, you know, the gig economy is going to have an impact on how this gets, on, on how we how we look at things going forward. That's going to be a model of what I think people do. I think companies are going to look for ways to, uh, uh, to pandemic proof or crisis proof their organizations in ways they maybe hadn't considered before. No doubt. Absolutely. Yeah. No doubt. Um, so, so yeah, I think there, there will be uh, a risk. You know what, at a macro level, this is very similar to getting the virus at a, at a, at a micro level. Um, if it doesn't kill you, you'll get immunity. And I think this is true for countries as well. Uh, COVID-19 is not going to kill America. Um, it, it's a very nasty kind of situation. Um, but the America that emerges from it will get immunity from this, will be much more resilient to a future shock of this type. Uh, and what I mean by that is it will be more resilient from an organizational structure point of view. As you pointed out, companies will, uh, will probably stay uh, more distributed, more decentralized, more resilient. Um, hopefully that will mean good things for workers. Again, it could go either way um, and there'll be a winners and losers situation. Best we can do when we're interacting with people that are on the market, particularly a lot sure. of our customers who are recruiters and HR people, is how do we equip them to, uh, to be effective or competitive in this new future? Um, because a lot of them are kind of uh, inevitably going to be stuck in, 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 you know, the pre COVID world. Um, you know, it's interesting because I, I I'm sitting here going through my list of business contacts, people that I work with every day, clients, uh, uh, colleagues, uh, people that we've partnered with in the past. And I've, I, it sounds morbid, but I've actually done kind of a, a ticker in my head. Who do I think is gonna, is gonna be able to adapt to this new paradigm. And I can see a couple of our clients out there right now. And I'm, you know, 
uh, that are going to struggle making that shift because they're extremely large and it's big ship, small rudder, right? I mean, it's hard for them to, to make that turn quickly. And I think you'll see an emergence of innovative entrepreneurs who will figure this out way before and they'll begin to grab market share over the course of the next few years as they not only address the challenges of a situation like this, but they also address worker preferences, right? And in ways that big companies are going to maybe still struggle to do. Two more quick questions because I know we're running out of time here. Um, in, a, in a few words, advice to job seekers. What would you tell people across all disciplines to focus on right now during this time? Um, I think the smart thing to do is to, I mean, there's immediate need. Okay. So I totally get it. Um, there's people with, with uh, living on very short margins and if they're out of work right now, they need a job. Um, so I think number one, if that is your situation, uh, you need to drop your, your preferences. Um, now is not the time to think career long-term. It's about just getting something and making sure, uh, the bills are paid. Um, the second thing slightly longer term is to recognize that the future is, is already here. Uh, this is a distributed, remote-only future, uh, so it's very important, I think, that you uh, develop the skills um, for this type of thing, meaning getting good at digital, getting good at video comms, um, getting, um, getting good at networking. Um, like you've got to, like you mentioned the coffee meeting, sale, uh, traditional sales are always in person. Um, after this is over, most sales is going to be done by video. Um, and the most effective salesperson is going to be someone who can really do good video closes. Yeah. Um, so same thing with, um, on, on the recruiting side, um, the people who can really be fluent and, and effective with the, the new, uh, not even new technology, but the, uh, the, 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 the technology is now come into prominence. Uh, they're the folks that are going to, going to survive. Also, I would additionally add, everyone needs to build this type of resiliency in to their personal plans. Uh, in the same way countries have not done this and the same way companies have not done this, individuals also have not done this. Um, we need to get better at saving for a rainy day if we can. Uh, we also need to be get it, getting better at um, planning for a shocking event. Um, uh, you know, we're, we're looking at a world that is rapidly changing. Um, this pandemic was guaranteed to happen. Um, you know, it's almost like the, the, the big one in, in California. We know it's going to happen at some point. This is going to happen. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so you've got to prep for it. Um, you know, have you got your grab bag? Have you got a way you can survive a, a shocking scenario like this? Not to say I have, but um, it, it's worth thinking about this rather than just, you know, cutting everything to the bone and, and, and maxing out. Uh, it's, it's a big shock and, you know, hopefully uh, it will be uh, a shock. A lot of us will, uh, will become more resilient over as we, as we learn how to, how to handle this particular period. Yeah, I think you're going to find that people are going to become... This is, this is one of those, and I hate to say, I hate to use this term, but this is Darwinism in business, right? This is, can you, can you adapt to survive, and can you find ways to evolve uh, in such a way that you're still as effective as you were before in face-to-face -face, uh, situations? Yeah. Um, um, I, I, I can't thank you enough for taking time, and I'm so glad you and your family are safe. Uh, it, uh, it does my heart good uh, to know that you're doing okay. Let's make sure we stay in touch because I'd love to hear more about what's going on over there in the UK. Yep, will do. Thanks a lot, Ron, and, uh, and stay safe, everybody. Um, uh, we'll get through this. Yeah, for sure, for sure. All right, everybody, that is Humbly. He is the founder of Workspace IO and the curator of Recruiting Brain Food. It's a wonderful newsletter, a wonderful podcast. If you haven't, gone out and checked him out, I would suggest you do, and I'll make sure that we have uh, his contact information and everything to get in touch with him uh, in the comments section below, whether you're listening on uh, one of the platforms or watching on YouTube. We appreciate it. And Hung, thanks again, man. We'll talk to you soon. Take care, everybody. All right, buddy. Bye now. Well, that's going to do it for us today. We want to thank you for listening in uh, on the show or watching it on YouTube. We really appreciate uh, your support. And a big thank you also to our guest Hung Lee of Workspace IO for lending his incredibly intelligent voice to this conversation. Now, if you like what we did here today and you want to stay up to date, then like, subscribe, and share on your platform of choice. You can also connect with me or the show on social media, on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or Snapchat, or you can find me directly on LinkedIn. Next Monday, April 6th, join us for the next episode of Talent Unfiltered as Enrique Rubio, the founder of the global community and movement called Hacking HR, joins us to discuss the future of work, which as of now probably means something much different than it did a few months ago. Until then, peace.